Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kevin Hatfield, the Interim Assistant Director for Academic Initiatives with Residence Life University Housing, also an Adjunct Assistant Professor with the History Department. And on behalf of University Housing, I'm honored to welcome all of you this evening to the Bean West Conference Room in the Bean Complex. And our, tonight's panel is titled Aesthetic Hegemony, Cross-Cultural Ideals of Physical Beauty and Body Image. And Community Conversation Series is a production of, it's a living learning initiative of, of Residence Life University Housing. And panels such as this evening's discussion are co-produced by the students of the Hamilton Think Tank and the Walton Advisory Board, which are two academic groups in the residence halls. This particular panel was brainstormed by the Walton Advisory Board, and it's our concluding panel of winter term. Uh, the Walton Advisory Board, and we always retender our standing invitation. If you'd like to contribute to future community conversations, we'd love to have you join us. We meet every Wednesday in the DeMet Lounge of the Walton Complex, and so feel free to drop in. It's a fairly casual group. If you're available anytime between 5 and 6, uh, you can arrive late or depart early. We're just always interested to have new ideas, and uh, we hope you can join us. And again, that's in the DeMet Lounge every Wednesday at 5. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our co-sponsors, the, the Robert D. Clark Honors College, the Oregon Humanities Center, and Undergraduate Studies have collaborated with University Housing for the past six years to make the Community Conversation Series possible, so we'd like to acknowledge their support. I also want to point out a few items that you found on your seats when you arrived this evening. Uh, you have a, a comment card, at which we'd love to have some feedback, and so if you could take a moment this evening and provide us with some feedback, we have a golf pencil box over there if you don't have a writing instrument with you this evening. Uh, there's also a bibliography, which we'll talk about more in a moment, but that was uh, put together by Ed Teague, who I'll introduce formally in a moment, but that's an annotated bibliography to go along with our discussion this evening, which will also be available electronically on our Community Conversations website. Uh, you'll also notice some clickers, uh, personal response systems. I'm sure many of you have used those in your large lecture courses at some point. And they're under the chair, I'm being told, if they're not on the chair. Uh, we're going to have some questions posed this evening after the panel delivers their opening comments. And what you need to make sure is that there's an on button and you want to see the green light on your clicker, otherwise your response will not be recorded. Uh, the second most important thing is you want to aim toward this receiver that's dangling from uh, the banner. So make sure that you aim toward there and we'll explain more. You have about 30 seconds to answer and we'll be posing some questions. So have those ready to go. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel this evening. Unfortunately, we had uh, two panelists that were unable to join us uh, due to illness and course conflicts. Uh, I just wanted to mention Robin Zabrowski, who is a graduate teaching fellow and a doctoral candidate in the Department of Philosophy. Uh, she's currently working on a dissertation titled, We Are Plastic, Human Variability and the Myth of the Standard Body. And so she would have been an ideal panelist this evening sharing some cutting edge research, but unfortunately she's living in Portland as she's writing up her dissertation and uh, was, came down with a horrible bout of the flu and so was unable to, to drive down to Eugene this evening. But we do have copies of her abstract uh, and her prospectus she sent us as well. So if that's something you're more interested in, uh, we have that to share with you as well. So the folks who are with us this evening, and, and I think our order of presentation is going to begin with Ed Teague, so I'll rearrange my notes here a bit. Uh, introduce Ed. Uh, we have many library partners, and in this case, Ed is doing double duty. He put together our bibliography, and initially he agreed to put together a wonderful uh, visual slideshow, which we'll present here in a moment. Uh, but since we were short panelists this evening, uh, we talked him into joining us and, and talking more formally about uh, the presentation he put together. Uh, Ed is the department head of the Architecture and Allied Arts Library. He's also a subject specialist for architecture, interior and landscape architecture, historic preservation, and theater. So busy. <laughs> uh, Ed teaches courses as well on uh, the use of information resources uh, within all those subject areas. He's also the author of several noted books including Henry Moore, a Bibliography and Reproductions Index, and an electronic resource, The Architecture of the University of Oregon, which is something I definitely want to go and, and look into a little bit more. A and I'll let Ed introduce his PowerPoint uh, presentation here in a moment. Uh, we're also joined this evening by Sarah Bobway, who is an undergraduate international student uh, from Uganda, and she is also serving as an International Cultural Services Program student, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with that program, it's a unit of international affairs, and it's designed to bring together a select group of University of Oregon international students uh, to provide Oregon communities, both on the campus and throughout the state, with valuable exposure to world's uh, cultural diversity, and so we're Glad to have Sarah with us this evening. And then one of our own RAs, who also is a peer health educator, uh, Hillary Stanley, is joining us this evening. 
And again, just for those of you who may not be familiar with the Peer Health Education Program, uh, it represents the outreach and educational component of the Health Center at the University of Oregon. And students such as Hillary provide disease prevention, health promotion, and educational services to fellow students. And I'll also mention that Hillary is, if I have this correct, majoring in human physiology. That's correct. And she's also a resident assistant, so we're happy to have Hillary as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Pam. Uh, on behalf of the University Libraries, thank you for the opportunity to uh, meet with you today. We always like the uh, chance to promote our resources and to become a, an integral part of your life at the university. What I did tonight was, was the fun part, and that's create a, an image show. And I made use of a database we have uh, called Art Store. Have any of you used Art Store yet? Yeah. Well, Art Store is a fantastic database of images of art and architecture. There are actually 700,000 in there. So they are of good size to download for presentations, to put in your reports, uh, theses, and so forth. And before we go to the actual PowerPoint slides, I just want to show you how to find art store. This is the library's home page and you see on the left hand column under find resources various links by format such as books, sound recordings, uh, journal titles and so forth. And one of them is to photos, maps and images. And if you just click that for me, thanks. And you see a variety of sources there and uh, in there you see a link to Art Store. That's one convenient way to get to it. Um, so we won't go into Art Store today, but keep that in mind that among our hundreds of databases, there are some um, for images and some for recordings and some for text and journals and so forth. So the presentation uh, that we have, you can find on this page where you can see the other handouts uh, created for um, the community conversation series and uh, this PowerPoint presentation is a mixture of images from different cultures um, across different time periods which gives you an idea of how the body has been represented um, and so it uh, should be automatic and it's about 10 or 12 minutes
presentation. Um, did you want to talk about it any or just move sure. on? Okay, I just wanted, I was just curious, I don't have any really prepared comments, but I'm just curious what your impressions are about any of the art that you saw. Any, any favorites or anything that struck you that you remember? Yes. yes. Yes, go ahead. And what, what you were saying, if I could repeat it so that every, people didn't hear it, was you were noting how there was diversity in the way women were being depicted there, whereas at least nowadays in our culture there seems to be some kind of standard about thinness and so forth. Yeah. I also kind of noticed that as the, the paintings got more and more towards like the 19th century or the, the 20th century, that uh, it became more and more abstract. Oh. It looked like a lot of it was more kind of that cubic style, a lot of like, right. Picasso sort of stuff. Whereas before there were, you know, like the Greek models, uh -huh. these are, these are Greeks. And then after that it was kind of like, a kind of a European period, I guess, I don't know. But it's, mm -hmm. yeah, romantic period and all that, and that's where we saw a lot of that, like really cool stuff. Too. But I just noticed this, it got on, body image sort of got skewed and people started looking at it. It seemed like they were looking at it much differently, kind of see it a little more of an abstract sort of uh, not just the body itself. Yeah, I think uh. there's more to the physical appearance. Uh -huh. any, any other ideas? Yes? Um, it would have been interesting to count the amount of male versus female. Uh -huh. I'm not saying that you had a bias in design, <laughs> but just wondering like, if there was a difference in general between um, the genders. I tried to balance it out, actually. And with a few hermaphrodites. <laughs> and actually, when in, in using art store, I, I the search was actually nude, and uh, so I was actually aiming for the body. And then I tried to get different media to balance the gender, and then the balance of the uh, cultures, so that there's sculpture, two dimensional, and so forth. So it almost became visual. After that, anybody else? Was yes. Chose news? To reflect the body. Yeah. And also, it, it really narrowed it down a lot because um, there are a lot of clothed people, you know, and so you can find a lot of different cultural representations with costume. But how a culture depicts the body itself. I mean, we can see how that really varies considerably. But one thing I did notice, because, because the topic is hegemony, which I, it's not a common word, but I think it means like, um, like control or power or influence. And um, in creating this presentation, it made me think, well, the artists are not really being controlled by the culture necessarily. I mean, they're responding to market. And it's kind of like what you were saying, that whatever the hegemony is, it's not necessarily reflected in the art. It's a different kind of hegemony going on if it is, like religious might be, through the idols. But maybe it's marketing or something else going on. And certainly, if, if we were showing costumes, we could see the fads of fashion going on. <clears throat> But you don't see as much with, with the bodies. Yes? Was it difficult to find um, different cultures being represented in news? Yes, and actually that's a really interesting point. Um, I was, I, sometimes I review books for uh, periodicals, and one book that I volunteered for, which turned out to be a mistake, was called The Impossible Nude. And it was actually about why the Chinese do not have nudes in their art. And it was very difficult for me to deal with because it got very philosophical and deep, the way the French tend to do. <laughs> but that is one culture in which you very rarely find a nude depicted. 
And so the author's perspective was having to do with, uh, say, mysticism, Eastern mysticism and so forth, that the body is not viewed in the same way. And the West actually thinks of the nude, whereas maybe other cultures don't. The other cultures think of naked versus nude. So yes, it, uh, all cultures don't perceive of the, the body as nude in the same way. Anything else? Okay, uh, good evening. Um, I must say I am honored to come here before you and speak about my home. I'm from Uganda, and tonight I'll just be giving you a perspective of how we view our body image and physical beauty. So I come from only a single aspect of what a Ugandan is. There are many tribes in the country, there are about 50 tribes, and each tribe has its own uh, perspective of what they consider beauty. And I just belong to one of those tribes. I might be a bit biased in what I tell you tonight, uh, so please forgive me for that. Um, so one thing, I guess I could start with a personal story. When I was in high school, I was really skinny, and I really didn't think twice about it. You know, I was like, there's no problem, but my parents were very concerned, and my mom, I remember specifically telling me that if I look really skinny, people begin to think that I have AIDS. So that's how being skinny viewed in Uganda, at least by the older majority, um, the older group, consider parents' age, my parents' age. If you're really skinny, you're considered to have AIDS or HIV. So it's not a good thing to be skinny. And that really does reflect a lot on what people think about the way they look, um, especially when you look at the two age groups, our age group and older people. Of course, there's a lot of media influence, TV, Facebook, magazines. So a lot of my peers want to be skinny, want to have straight hair, because that's what looks more fashionable. They don't want to have the curly hair, <laughs> afro type. Um, so a lot of uh, uh, girls mainly go to the extent of trying to straighten their hair and trying to lighten themselves, because our perspective as youth is that if you're lighter, you're beautiful. So some girls go to the extent of bleaching themselves with chemicals and then they look a different color on their face from the rest of their body. So we, we have a very <coughs> obscure view at the moment of how we view beauty because there's this conflict with what we are used to, what our parents are used to, and what we see on TV. So a lot of our age groups are struggling with what's right and what's okay. And that's something I myself even deal with, especially having come to America and seeing something else here and then going home and ex being expected to be something else. Um, let's see. Uh, there is a big difference, too, between people who live in cities and people who live in the villages. The people who live in the villages aren't exposed to the media. There is no electricity, so they don't really see what's on TV. They don't have access to magazines. And they really don't have um, per a perfect body image. And therefore, they are more relaxed about it. The girls are more. Um, curvier, have bigger hips because that's what is expected from them, especially if they're supposed to bear children. The, um, the theory is that if you have bigger hips, you can have more kids. Whereas the city girls who want to be educated and go to college and have all this media, you don't see it that way and would rather not have big hips or a big behind or a fuller chest and go to extremes of dieting. We don't have Botox or plastic surgery, those aren't yet introduced to Uganda, and therefore not many people have access to it within the country. It's very expensive as well, so that's something you don't hear of. The extent someone would go is dieting or not eating for days. But then again, I don't know how long they can last with that. Um, yeah, I think I really don't have a lot more to say about it, so if you do have questions, please feel free to ask. We'll have time for questions at the end as well, so if you want to think about them. You mentioned dieting, you mentioned it as like an extreme, and like here it's mm -hmm. dieting isn't really viewed as an extreme thing, like lots of people go on diets like all the time. Mm -hmm. um, in the culture 
culture that you come from is dieting extreme? I would say it is. When you say you're going on a diet, people take it in a negative view. They're like, you're really trying to lose weight in an extreme manner, water and bread only, not eating healthy. So yeah, it's taken in an extreme manner back home. Um, along with that, is there any disorder eating? Like, does it go so far mm -hmm. as to become anorexia or bulimia? That's a good question. Um, no one has really done any research on it, and from my personal experience, I've never encountered anyone who has, who is or was anorexic or bulimic. And if it is there, people don't talk about it. It's not something that we would tell our parents or friends. I have another question too. Um, viewing the, the slides, mm -hmm. did you see any images that you thought were particularly beautiful or particularly confusing? Or anything that um, actually, I guess a lot of the women I saw who had bigger hips with tiny waist is what we consider being very beautiful. So those did were more attractive to me. That's all. Yes. Um, you talked a lot about like how what the body image for a woman is. Mm -hmm. Is there like a certain body image for a male? Like and slides are all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I think, um, at least historically, there is, because um, ma the male figure is supposed to support the family. So having the physical, str you know, being perceived, perceived as being physically strong is important. So yes, to some extent, there is. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Hillary and I'm from the Peer Health Education Program. Um, it's a two-term class offered through Family or yeah, Family and Human Services now. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you guys about nutrition um, and how to have good nutrition in the residence halls kind of help with the body image, I guess. Um, and earlier this evening there was a pre-panel dinner and we had a discussion about society's influence on beauty and our perspectives of beauty. Um, and during the conversation, um, the topic came up about Dove's Real Beauty campaign that they're doing right now. So um, just to kind of mm -hmm. give you guys something to think about for how society and the media has influenced our perception of beauty and um, just the disconnect between reality and the media sometimes portrays. Um, we're just going to show a brief video clip from one of the Dove commercials really quick. back again. So that was the video clip. Um, as someone that is a second year RA, I've lived in the residence halls for three years and I'm going to be the first to admit that having good nutrition can be one of the hardest things. Not because it isn't available, but mostly it's up to, it's your control whether you have good nutrition or not. Um, I mean, look at the lines that form on chicken strips and french fries day, or like as the term goes on, like the line gets exponentially larger for ice cream. So like, there's definitely a lot of those like comfort foods available. Um, and all too often we 
eat those more often than the foods that we're supposed to eat. Um, it's almost as if the eight year old inside of us is going crazy now that we have this like free reign to put whatever we want in our bodies. So it's like, I want hostess cupcakes and I want french fries. Like all the things that were kind of limited or restricted in our past are just yours for the taking now. So that can make it kind of hard. Um, and as if that wasn't difficult enough, it can be really hard in college because social eating is such, like that's what we do. When you hang out with friends, you go get food, you go to Muchas Gracias in the middle of the night, you go hang out at Common Grounds at two in the morning. There's so many op opportunities that come up just to eat and hang out with friends that it's hard to pass up on those opportunities. And even if you go with the intent of like not eating a whole bunch of snack food, it can still happen because snack food's good. Like, I don't think any of us are gonna deny that. Um, so how are we supposed to balance all this nutritional information and still find time to get the recommended physical daily activity? It can be difficult, but it can be done. Um, so I'm just gonna share some tips with you that I've learned from my own personal experience and just on the general level of nutrition. Um, the biggest thing that helps me as someone that lives in the residence halls is to not keep snack foods in my room, like chips, cookies, all kinds of little snacky things because um, more often than not like I find myself absent-mindedly snacking on things and before you know it like mm -hmm. the one pounder box of Cheez-Its is like totally bare and then you're like where did all those Cheez-Its go and then you realize it was you and it's just kind of gross because that's a lot of Cheez-It. Um, <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> um, so instead I try and keep my room stocked with a lot of like water because more like a lot of times when you think you're hungry it's you're just really thirsty so it's good to have a lot of water on hand and it's also good to have like fresh fruits and vegetables yogurts v8 juice drinks like just stuff that if you do have a snack and or like a hunger and water's not quite cutting it that you're putting something that you need in your body instead of cupcakes and all kinds of stuff um and so it helps limit how much i actually snack on but it also helps curb any of those like late night hunger pains that come up every now and then. Um, another thing that's important to keep in mind is the concept of balance. It's not that you can't ever indulge yourself and have chicken strips on chicken strips day. It's just you need to keep in mind what other things you're eating that day or at that meal. So instead of getting chicken strips and french fries, maybe try substituting fresh vegetables or fruit, something so that you're still getting nutrition, nutritious food with the chicken strips, but you're not just totally going crazy with saturated fats and fried foods and whatnot. Um, for some people that are more visual, it helps for them to write down what they've eaten that day and the portion sizes so that you kind of can like see what you've eaten and kind of keep track of it. Um, and that way you know, you know, like I haven't had a lot of fruits, maybe I should try and incorporate that more in my dinner or what have you. Um, and another thing with portion sizes is um, a lot of times we tell ourselves like, I know that they give big portions at grab and go, so I'm not gonna eat all that's on my plate. But that's a lot harder to stop yourself from finishing everything on the plate than to just ask for smaller portions. And most of the time they'll be able to give you smaller portions. So, you know, just say like, I'd like half a scoop of rice or whatever, because a lot of the times um, the portion sizes are distorted and it's, not, it's a lot more than you should actually be eating. Um, and another um, portion advice tip um, would be to share something with a friend like instead of you know eating the whole whammy by yourself get a friend to share it with you or the cheesy griller or whatever your food choice may be um, and that way you're still getting the treat or the reward or whatever you want to call it um, but you're just getting half the calories and half you know so it's kind of cutting down so you're still not totally restricting yourself from those foods but you're not overindulging yourself either um, it's also a good idea to take advantage of the different custom crafted options that are available on campus at Fire and Spice, Hammy's, Duck's Bistro, all those kind of places. You get to choose what goes into your food. So it helps because you know exactly what's going into your food and you know how much is going into your food. Um, and it's also a good way to keep things different mix things up a little bit. That way you're not eating the same food every single time. Because if you get tired of the same old food, you're more likely to go off campus to the fast food places and that's not good for your wallet and it's typically not good for your waistline. So just keep things new, try new things. Try putting pepperoncinis on your sandwich if you've never had them before, because you may like it, you never know. Like I personally don't, it's too spicy for me, but you know, <laughs> go crazy with the pepperoncinis. <laughs> um, so how, are we supposed to get 
enough physical activity that we're supposed to like that can be really hard like I know most of us we have class we have to schedule and studying time and socializing and extracurricular activities it can get crazy but one of the first steps into incorporating physical activity in your daily routine is just to schedule it like um, it's a it, you're more likely to go to the gym or go for a walk or whatever your physical physical activity of choice may be you're more likely to do it if you say at three o'clock this is my time when I'm gonna try and do something whether it's just walking around campus going and playing a pickup game of soccer at the turf fields whatever you prefer um, if you schedule a time as opposed to saying I'll just do it later tonight I'll do it later tonight and then later tonight comes and it never really happens and um, also, you can try mixing up what type of physical activity you're doing instead of running on the treadmill every time. Um, try something through the outdoor program or um, take advantage of the different classes that the rec center offers um, or try something new. Um, this year I've just started playing racquetball. I've never played before. It was kind of an accident that my friend and I started playing, but now I'm like all about racquetball. So you never know what's out there until you try it. Um, and on a final note, um, Take advantage of the different resources that the health center has to offer. As part of your student fees, you pay to basically be a member of the health center. So things are at a greatly reduced cost when you actually do use those options. Um, there's a nutritionist in the health center you can set up an appointment with. It's only $8 to meet with her. And she can help work with you to kind of like figure out what food, what food groups you're lacking, what nutrients you need, and kind of develop a customized game plan for your um, nutritional intake and she can also work around if you have diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, she can help so that you're eating a diet that works best with any medical needs that you have. Um, also every Tuesday at the health center there's free cholesterol screening so if you know that you have high cholesterol problems or you don't even know what your cholesterol is it's free at the health center every Tuesday. Um, just make sure that you're you fast for eight hours in advance um, to the cholesterol screening because it'll give you the most accurate reading. Um, and if you're kind of worried about if you're moving off campus next year and you don't really know how to cook and you're kind of worried it's just going to be corn dogs and ramen every night because the microwave's so easy to use, um, there's a class offered every term called Boiling Water 101. And it's a vegetarian, it teaches you how to cook vegetarian foods, but a lot of the skills you can, like the prep work and how to coordinate meals and shopping on a budget can be transferred even if you're not vegetarian. So. If you're not vegetarian, don't get worried that like, ah, I can't go to that because I eat meat or what have you. Um, so take advantage of that class. Um, and then if you have any other questions, um, there's the Peer Health Resource Office on the first floor of the Health Center. We staff it from 10 to 4, Monday through Friday. Um, we've got a lot of great resources there. We have um, phone numbers to places in the community. Um, there's always someone there staffed from the class and we can help answer questions or help guide you on where to find the answers to your questions. Um, and we also have a library with books that you can check out on every topic, including nutrition and personal health issues. So, um, and it's free to check the books out and everything. So you should stop on by. And hopefully that helped you guys look at resident hall food as not just the cafeteria line and take a new <laughs> fresh look at it. <laughs> well, thank you guys. That was fabulous. My name's Kim. And I'm the Walton Advisory Board, otherwise known as Rob, and I'm going to help you guys use these, and it's going to be fun. So, um, I know what you've all been waiting for, you get to press the button. So, you're going to have 30 seconds to answer. You want to make sure that you point it towards there. The question will be up there, and then you'll see kind of what you have. So, if you press oh, one for a guess, and then suddenly you're like, oh, no, I mean no, you can press it again, and it'll do whatever you press last. So go ahead and, oh, we'll start in one second. <laughs> Once he presses play. So did this video make you feel worse about your body? With a question mark, pretend. Um, so go ahead and do it. Um, so that was the dub one, if you're confused, but I figured. So once the 30 seconds is over then. Oh, I have to do mine. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, yeah. There we go. Press. <laughs> this button. Each individual response. Oh. Yeah, so the numbers go to your response. So each of you have a oh, number, technically. Hmm. Where does it say your number? On the back of it. 
So, um, most people said that it didn't make them feel worse about their body, um, which my guess is because it was showing you that not that they aren't perfect as well. But um, you want to go to the next one? So, have you ever felt self? And I didn't know how to spell conscious. I'm sorry. <laughs> conscious <laughs> about your body, and it didn't have spell check. Hmm. Yeah, mine never works with these things. Yeah. Oh, well. I tried. <laughs> no, it did on the first one, and now it's not. You could always do it more than once to make sure it works. Oh, there it goes. It was up there. Yay. Yeah. Oh, so everyone. <laughs> Yay. Way to be honest, guys. Okay. So the next one goes with it. So which situation, uh-oh, have you felt most uncomfortable with your body? Date, school, work. Um, oh, this is workout area, gym. Um, around family, around friends, all these situations. Is Are people doing it? The bottom one, <laughs> all situations. Comfortable in. Sorry. You can redo your thing. It's funny to look at it. Everybody and see his like arms in the air with little clickers. It's fun though. Is yours working today? I don't know. Once okay. So let's see. Oh I I don't have my piece of paper. I don't okay. So the first one's date, then this one was work, this one was school, yeah, um, gym, yeah, I had a feeling that one would be big. Um, this one was family, yeah, family, friends, other, okay, so family, people are, oh, that's good, um, friends, other, and then um, that's, those are the people who are always comfortable. That's amazing. I'm so proud of you guys. <laughs> oh, it was comfortable. We, sorry. It was comfortable or uncomfortable. I don't know. It was comfortable, but um, now it's uncomfortable too. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Okay, so have you ever had someone comment uh, about your weight? So these are the people who, oh. Okay. So parent, sibling, friends, other family members, such as an aunt, uncle, cousin, a significant other, all of the above, none of the above, other. I, I don't know where they I think I threw them away. <laughs> so most are. No, six was all of the above. So, so people who have had people comment about their weight, most of it was all of the above. That's interesting. Okay. So the color still so green is medium. Red is, oh, I don't know. I don't know that those go with it. Maybe it's like accuracy I or something. Confidence, yeah. Oh. So probably everyone's on high right now, or medium, because no one's pressing it. So there's an H and there's an L, so you can press high or low, but you don't really need to do it in this situation. So, yeah, you could do, like, I'm really confident with my response. A lot of people say that and put it on high or not. Okay. So do you have a Facebook profile that shows your whole body or just your face? Oh, sorry, A is going to be whole body, B is going to be face. This was a little, <laughs> oh. 
If you don't have Facebook, then just don't answer. <laughs> what if you have Facebook and what? Well, is it the face of the rabbit or the body of the rabbit? Maybe it's. <laughs> Oh, it's about half and half. A little, uh, yeah, good job using the high, guys. I, I like the confidence. Okay, so then was this a conscious decision? Did you mean to put your whole body or did you mean to just put your face? I think like if it yeah. Your, yeah. if it turned red, try pressing yeah. it again. See if it just didn't respond. So okay, so I take it that the lows were the people who were like, I really didn't mean to do that. Maybe I don't know. You don't. It's anonymous. You don't have to answer. But most of People didn't mean to do that. Okay, so when someone looks at you, what do you think that they notice first? Weight, face, personality, backside, front side, try to keep a PG, um, height, haircut, fashion, outfit, or other. So, okay, so most people think they see their face. Um, can we pull it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I really want you to do with this one is to look and see which one you put and what you think or what you notice about, or, okay, when someone looks at you, what they notice about you because next we're going to do what you notice about someone else first. So I want you to be able to compare it and see if it is what you know, you'd think that it would be for most people. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know, I'm just like, I'll just press it a bunch of times, it'll get up there. <laughs> And it's the same for the faces, but there are people who do a little bit of everything. What was six? Six <laughs> so, so no one, no one thought of height. But when I was coming up with these, I asked someone what they looked at first, and they said height. So there's one person out there that looks at height. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. So. Yeah, that's and pretty. That's a pretty amazing point, I think, because my best friend and I, a lot of times, will be walking down the street, and you'll notice that mostly guys will like they'll be driving and they'll turn and they'll watch you, and it's really sketchy sometimes. And we always we always discuss how um, there's this book that talks about how guys feel that they have the right 
and I'm not saying that you guys do, so don't <laughs> don't come back and be like, no, I don't. But um, how they feel that they have the right to just like look at these girls and to stare them down, but they wouldn't do it to another guy, and they and that many women wouldn't do it to other guys. I mean, it might depend on the situation, but it's kind of the same thing where it's like, oh, girl, oh, okay, but maybe not. Okay, that was all that I came up with for those. So thanks for playing. Um, you all win the prize. And uh, now we'll do questions for your panelists. And with that, please use, use the microphone so that they can hear you back there. Oh, yeah. Um, so I have a question for all the panelists, kind of. Um, I feel like in our society, we, we know that we shouldn't be self-conscious or we think that that's a bad thing. But at the same time, we're picking all these media and the stuff that reflects a poor body image. So we're like going out and buying these magazines and doing all these things that really we're like, oh, well, that's not me, but you still embrace it, you still want it. Um, how did the ad, um, do you think that changes the ad, or do you think that it's just kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that we we take in what we want, so we don't see beauty from other things? Does that make sense? Um, it was more of will will uh, changing the body or like the images, making them more realistic, will that affect our intake or our image? Or will we still gravitate towards thin is beautiful and all these unrealistic body images? I guess like on that note, like I almost wonder if there's a certain element of like what a generation grows up with. Um, like for example, what Sarah was talking about how the older um, people in her country, you know, in her uh, where she's from, um, view being really skinny is like that person probably has AIDS or HIV, is whereas the younger people don't see it that way. Um, and so I don't know, like maybe if all of a sudden the ads were to change and be real pictures, like we still have this preconceived notion that we've grown up with, and we like maybe we would notice things like this person isn't skinny enough or whatever. Like I don't know, or maybe we wouldn't. I don't know. That's an interesting thought, though. I think too. Um people tend to want what they don't have. So, I mean, if a skinny person looked at someone in a magazine who had maybe a bigger bust, they might want that. So I don't know, I think maybe there's something psychological where we just want what we don't have. <laughs> not apparent at the moment <laughs> because I think um, there's a lot of push to still the image of being skinny I mean even the shows on TV I mean even things like American Idol where bigger women are being told off that they have to lose weight you know that it's already just driving towards you have to be skinny so if it changes it'll take a while I think and I would agree with that. And I think the more that like technology changes, the more we can manipulate our bodies and make them look not the way they're supposed to. Like, I feel like with the rate that that's changing, it's going to take for us to maybe like the pendulum to go the other way towards a more like. kinds of stuff or like Botox and all this stuff and like you know even like when you look at people in Hollywood you know where they're like 40 is the new 30 but like all these 40 year old actresses and what don't look like regular 40 year old women so I think it's going to take a while for it to go the other direction. 
Um, I had a question. I don't know if you know this, um, but just from like studying art, um, if you know when or where it first originated, my guess is that the more like basic and um, native that you get, the more often you'll see the image of big women being beautiful. So my question is, I guess when did the when did the skinniness image originate slash where? Well, I, I don't know about skinniness, but the whole notion of like the ideal really comes about through classical Greece, like fifth century, fourth century BC. And I think because you're you're right, early on the voluptuous female which was associated with fertility. And I think uh, in, in Greek culture, a lot of that had to do with mathematics, too, because they were looking for templates and ideals so that they could, you know, proportions, like we saw in an image of proportions. Uh, but that, our whole culture has been ingrained with classical ideals, judicial system, everything, architecture. So it kind of permeates our culture in that sense. But there's, there's kind of another idea that's coming about, thinking about change, and that's, I think, uh, people are becoming more health conscious. And I think there's di people are also seeing a difference between ideas of beauty versus ideas of health. And I think that's, that might drive some changes. I think people are, are listening more to what ideas at least as you get to my age, maybe you know, <laughs> your age. Um, as, as opposed, because people are becoming more savvy about marketing too, I think. Mm -hmm. But even in, in health issues, there, there are conflicting notions about whether heaviness is bad or good. So I think once that gets resolved, things will change. I mean, nobody thinks that anorexia is good, but that doesn't really influence people <laughs> from wanting to be thinner and thinner. So. Yeah, kind of going along with that, um, I was talking to my mom. I just wrote a paper on this topic and turned it in today. I think too when we think about body image, we should also think about what people are doing like tattooing and piercings. It's not all about weight or hairstyles. I think a lot of people, because culturally in some cultures, it's accepted, it's expected for you to get a tattoo as a physical sign. It's seen in many cultures as being discriminated as well. So that's something to be talked about or to be considered at least that a lot of people consider beauty as you know, having something engraved on you or pierced on you or something like that. I think another factor is that we are becoming more diverse. <laughs> and so different cultures are influencing. It's, it's harder to be a 
hegemonists. <laughs> uh, once become more, our cultures become more diverse. There's a question at the back. Yeah, can we get a, a, like a concrete definition of uh, hegemony? To look it up. <laughs> As an example, patriarchy is like a hegemonistic structure for our society. It's dominating. It's kind of how we structure everything in our society. So that's hegemonistic. You guys don't it. use this? <laughs> Wikipedia. H E M E H G H G H G G sorry. E M O N Y. something could be said about uh, what what we as humans are supposed to look like without technology and without um, access to all the things that we have. So I think it's, I think um, in a discussion like this, it's, it would be important to, to have the definitions of um, hegemony or uh, to be careful when, when we use terms like real or, or more natural, just because they aren't necessarily more real and more natural. Something could be said about there's a whole internet culture of um, uh, avatars, and some people feel that their avatars are more real than their own self. So that's me. What are avatars? Avatars are. Uh, Should I look it up? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, for the course of the group, uh, an avatar is, um, is somebody's computer image that they have for chat rooms. Um, so um, you can see that they're like um, they're kind of like Sims almost. You can customize them and create them. And you put them as your, uh, as your. It's kind of like your Facebook picture almost, except way more customizable. And that, um, that is who you are uh, on the internet. Yeah, second line. Honestly, I don't think so, because it's something, I mean, my mother would talk about it, my aunts, my friends still do, even though they talk, you know, we have all this media influence and they want that, we still tend to admire <laughs> what our parents told us. So I think it would, I mean, at the back of my head, it's still there. you walk out of here and feel better about yourself? Anyone brave enough to say yes or no? <laughs> I'm not a question. You, I mean, coming to a different culture, a different country, do you feel the presence of a hegemony? I mean, getting back to your mm. question, is there is there a body aesthetic hegemony here that you can sense? Hmm, good question. Um, 
think I have felt, yes, a bit. I mean, just from what I see. But, I mean, it's not like anyone has forced it on me. Mm-hmm. It's just what I have decided to see mm-hmm. and take upon myself. So, yes, definitely moving to a different culture will influence how you feel about yourself. Um, I have a friend from Vietnam who, what she says at least, is that in her culture, the women are supposed to be really skinny and um, flat bottoms, but she doesn't have one. And so when she comes here, she feels a lot more comfortable. She can wear jeans. Whereas back home, she wears black pants because they make her look smaller because she feels everyone is telling her, how come you're so different from everyone else? But when she's here, she feels a lot more comfortable. So it can work both ways, I think. Yeah. So do you feel negatively or positively impacted by coming to the United States? Both. <laughs> I definitely, I think... The whole health aspect, like looking at more of am I healthy rather than am I skinny or am I not skinny, has impacted me. But then again, that's what I see, Tyra Banks has impacted me. So I I would say both. The Dove commercial um, is uh, is really really powerful in that it's um, it's trying to show it's it's kind of combating combat whatever the word I'm trying to say is uh, the uh, the like the popular images um, of uh, of what beauty is and I think it's showing a more realistic um, uh, sampling um, like it I, I feel like um, I I do feel that uh, you'll you'll get a better perspective of what beauty is if you just walk. On like the street, though, sometimes you see a lot of different people and body types, um, and so that's another way to fight. You just have to recognize it, I guess. Mm-hmm. But that's really hard. I think, um, like, obviously the Dove commercial is like, you know, it it represents something that that's a good force. But I also think that. Um, it's it's almost like they're just they just found another way to exploit um, the fears and and doubts of women that women have about themselves. Um, and so I, I think in that way, like to me, it was almost while while I believe that obviously like people should feel good about themselves, it's like it's it's just another mode of corporate exploitation of that. So. Actually, um, no, I think going off what you were saying, the fact that in terms of if you have a lot of people to work on you, if you have the money and the makeup to get to this place, it could go that way as well. Um, I think it was interesting that it was produced in Canada, so it wasn't the United States, but it was still going off of the Dove um, or camp or advertisement campaign. And I think it's important that they have done a lot of um, – campaigns where they go into high schools and talk with them about this and they explore the topic instead of just having a billboard campaign and um, I think what have become most effective is when they have women just in simple clothing up on billboards and so you see that you know or even in magazines so you can see that you know these women are actually you know the campaign is is really going back to basics so I think that's what's most effective for Dove right now. The other thing with that is, for me at least, it makes me want just to have that done, just to see like what I would look like if I had that done. Yeah. So, you know, in some ways, it I think it can help and make you feel better because you're like, oh well, that's not their real skin and everything like that. But at the same time, it's like, well, then maybe I'll just have that done in my pictures and then I'll be good. So. I think it can go both ways, even when it's showing something like that, because it's just what you're striving for rather than what it is. And I also think like it can be hard, like after, like immediately after watching something like that, you're like, okay, it, like reminded me that that's not a real image that they doctored a lot, but it's like, and then you go pick up a magazine, you're like, oh my gosh, that girl has the best abs. I wish my abs <laughs> looked like that, and then you like just totally like goes in one ear out the other. So it's almost like an easier said than done, like. It's easier to be like, I'm okay with myself than to like internalize it and remember that when you're exposed to all the media images sometimes. Mm-hmm. But 
I just wanted to ask you guys, what do you think the commercial would have been like if it would have been done in like reverse order, say starting from the model look and then going back to her normal self, or what impact do you think that would have on the community? I almost think that like, because seeing all the alterations, like when it gets to the computer part, for me, it's like, ah, oh, she looks really weird. Like her eyes are really weird now, like they're all stretched out. But I wonder that if it was in reverse, if that first image, you wouldn't think anything of it. Like you'd just be like, She's goofy. Yeah, she's a model, like I get it. And then, so if it was backwards, it might almost be like more effective or the same, I don't know, just it would have a different response maybe. we are patriarchal that we consider this a female ish a woman ish because someone asked me you know how many men versus women are in the slides and i noticed in compiling the bibliography um, that there are some books that deal with male body image issues but you don't hear that discussed as much mm -hmm. And um, the, if you look at a, a character of, of Superman when it first came out, he, he looks way more like, um, you know, an average, kind of an average person of the time. And now you look at Superman and he's ripped, huge shoulders, huge biceps. You can see an A-pack through his suit. <laughs> and, um, and so really it has changed a lot for men. And... Um, uh, maybe maybe not through art, but in ways that are maybe more prevalent in our day-to-day -day lives. They become superheroes. <laughs> uh, I was I I kind of agree that it, that it fluctuates, but um, if you look back to like the ancient Greek, I kind of think it, I thought it was interesting that um, across cultures it's kind of very similar. Like uh, um, strength, um, muscle tone is really valued. Like you saw the like from the ancient Greeks to um, to I don't, I can't even. Remember, uh, but a lot of the a lot of the statues showed um, like there was an ancient Greek statue that was a full eight pack and like just toned out, and it was uh, and the, there was a German statue that was just like chiseled straight chin with like like just chiseled body. And uh, um, the only culture that I saw that was vastly different would be the Japanese um, wrestlers, uh, and then there's one Greek painting that I that I, cause I was, I was kind of looking for it a little bit um, because I I think that it's a fascinating issue that's not very much talked about. I think it's interesting also just to note like the male ideal is a healthy body and all the versions of the female ideal that I have noticed have been quite unhealthy. So you have like, I mean, it's not that unhealthy, the ancient Greek sort of ideal, but it's definitely not like physically fit looking. Mm. So I mean, you're kind of looking at this like lazy lady mm. who's kind of just sort of and then now you've got this sort of like woman who's doing too much and is physically overexerting herself and is not physically capable, like, you know, pushing people towards anorexia and then all in between the sort of like corsets and the like removing body parts to make your corset go smaller and like everything's been unhealthy for like, and like the feet binding, like everything for women has always been unhealthy and for men it seems to be, be healthy and that's you could almost make the argument, though, that, like, for men, the, like, super chiseled, like, eight-pack thing has led, like, development of, like, people using steroids and stuff because that is an unattainable, I mean, like, it's kind of insane. And, like, the different, like, muscle, like, bodybuilding things where they, like, put the bronzer and that's all just kind of weird and oily. But, um, <laughs> like, that you could also make the argument that that's led to, like, you know, men having to pursue unhealthy lifestyle behaviors as well in order to live up to that expectation 
of what's been set forth through art and culture and stuff. One more question. Or, or comment. <laughs> Um, I think that something that um, that the whole like perception of male image stems from is like just our natural like instinct because humans are here to reproduce basically like it's the goal of all of life to reproduce and naturally um, we're just more attracted to people you know like people I guess who look more physically fit who will produce. Um, and that like subconsciously, you know, like says to us that they'll produce better offspring. And I think that's a big, um, a big part of uh, at least the male role because they look strong and they look physically fit and physically capable uh, like to raise children and produce good offspring, so. Thank you, everyone. I just want to thank our panel again, especially Ed Teague, who wasn't originally scheduled to be a panelist tonight. So, And again, I, I apologize for uh, two of our panelists that we had advertised not being able to join us tonight, Kristen Everson and Robin Zabrowski. W we do hope to invite Robin Zabrowski back to do kind of a work in progress talk, more of a fireside chat. And I appreciate the question about hegemony. That's, that was Robin's topic kind of specifically and she was gonna elaborate on that. But we do hope to invite her back uh, to kind of talk a little bit more about her research and her dissertation. But again, thanks to the panel for being so adaptive and, and extemporaneous tonight. We really appreciate it, so thanks.